All right, so yesterday, yesterday we're talking about um, determining whether we had um, one solution, no solutions, or infinite solutions uh, on two lines intersecting, okay? Um, and we're doing this graphically. The, the thing about, we, we talked about parallel lines, uh, and we said that the slopes had to be the same, okay? So if I look at this, this one here, um, if I write the equation of this blue one, so what's the y-intercept for this blue one? Negative 3. What is the slope? If I go from here, somewhere on my line, to get to somewhere else on my line, how many do I need to go? Okay, so down 1 to the right 2, so 1 over 2, and it was down, so it's got to be minus, right? Uh, so I get that. That's the equation of that blue line. Okay. Now, if I try to write the equation of the red line, okay, what's the y-intercept for the red line? One. And what's the slope there? One over two again. That's down one, so negative. So we get there in that situation. Those two equations, the slope is the same, right? But what do you notice about the y-intercepts? They are... They are different, right? Okay. If we look at this one here, the infinite solution one, okay, that would mean if we looked at both those equations, they're both, in this case, the red one and the blue one, they're both that one right there. So if the slopes are the same, the lines are parallel, as long as the y-intercepts are different. That makes them two different lines. If the y-intercepts are the same and the slopes are the same, then the lines are the same. Does that make sense? So we just got to pay attention to that. Ella. You could go up. Okay. Uh, so, so my slope is just a, a uh, set of directions or a mapping to go from one position on my graph to another. So one position on my line to another. So if I want to go from there to there, I'm just choosing those because they're really nice intersections of these like little light gray lines, right, the grid lines. Um, so I go up one, so that'd be positive one for my rise, and now I'm going left two, so it'd be negative two for my run, right? If I go rise over run, it'd be positive one over negative two, and that's still negative one half. So you go either direction you want to. Um, and, and I could have also gone, you know, I went up one over two, I could have gone up, or maybe I want to go from that point right there to that point. Well, then that's up two, and then left negative four, right? So positive 2, left negative 4, is that still reduced to negative 1 half? So your, your slope is just a mapping tool to go to start on your line, to leave it, but get back to it. Okay. Um, if I look over here, so th these two, everything is going to be different. Okay. Um, I'd say, I don't want to say all the time, but 99% of the time, slopes are different, y-intercepts are different. Okay. Um, you can't have this situation where your y-intercepts are the same, but slopes are different. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure that we don't just, if I give you uh, in a homework question, I give you like y equal 2x plus 3 and y equal 2x plus 5, and I say, how many times do those intersect? Once, none, or infinite? The defining factor is to look at that to determine whether it's none or infinite, but then you have to look at these and say, well, those are different, so these are two parallel lines. My fear is that if I just say the slopes have to be the same for you to determine parallel, is that I give you these two things, and you don't even look at the threes, and you just say those, and say, oh, they're the same, so they got to be parallel. So if there's parallel, there's no intersection. But in that situation, the lines are identical, right? So that would actually be an infinite number of intersection points. So I just want to make sure that we, we pay attention to that. Um, not, and, and the whole grand scheme of things and how many problems that we see and the, the types of problems we see, that's not a huge issue um, if we're just interested in getting questions right. Um, but in regards to like, learning the content, that's, that's something to talk about. Uh, this one says, tell whether the system will have zero, one, or if solutions first by that analysis, uh, and then uh, find, those if, find those solutions if there is um, only one. Okay, so... First thing I want to do is look at these two, okay? 
they have what's what's the slope for this one here? One, right? Understood one out front, understood one out there, right? Okay, now what does that tell me then? If the slopes are the same, but these numbers are different, those two lines are what to one another? They're parallel. Okay, now if, if, if you can't be convinced of that, let's go ahead and graph them. If I graph this first one, what's my y-intercept? Four. And your slope was up one, right one, right? And I could have gone down one, left one. I'm just going to put a bunch of these in here so I can draw this line without the grabbing that tool. All right. So roughly that line, right? Now if I go to this one here, what's the y-intercept there? Negative 3. And then you go up one over one, right? So I connect that with a straight line. Those things are never going to intersect, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So what's, what takes longer? If, if my only goal is to determine zero, one, or infinite solutions, does it take longer to look at the coefficient out in front of X and compare those, or to graph both of them? It takes longer to graph both, okay? So if my only, only concern is zero, one, or infinite solutions, I think it's, it's, it's useful to, to learn that, um, that comparison of slopes and y-intercepts to make our conclusion so we can kind of circumvent the graphing. Okay. Um, next one. Okay, do these have zero, one, or infinite solutions? Just based on looking at the slopes they should have how many solutions? If the slopes are the same, they're parallel. So if they're different, then they're the antithesis of parallel, which means they're gonna they're gonna converge, right? They're not parallel, they're gonna intersect. Okay. Um so if they're not parallel, how many and, and they're not the same line, right? Okay, to be the same line, they would have to have the same slope and the same y-intercept. So they're not the same line, and they're not parallel. So how many solutions will we have? We'll have one solution. So let's find it. So do that top one. What's your y-intercept there? Four. And where are you going to go from there? Up two, right one. Where, could I, where else could I have gone? Down to left one, good. Um, I know they're gonna intersect, so I'm gonna try to use I'm gonna try to be as precise as possible with my picture. I have no idea why that always starts out that thick and white. There we go. So that is that top line. So now the bottom line, what's your y-intercept with that one? Negative two. We're gonna go from there. Up one right two. Or we're down one left two, right? And there is our blue one. So where does it look like they intersect here? What points that look like? Negative 
negative four, negative four. One thing to pay, and it, it's human error. If I really zoom in on that intersection, and now I obviously I've got a lot less human error than you guys have, because I'm actually able, I'm able to use the the tools on this this program. But does that point so like negative four, negative four is actually like right there, the cross of that cross here. Is that point kind of miss it? Let me sense. So that's very common if if we're using um, just like freehand drawing, okay, not using like rulers and stuff like that. Uh, so just be careful with that. But I, I'd say probably 95% of the questions that we get, they're going to be set up uh, to intersect at like perfect integer coordinates. So negative 4, negative 4. Okay, a lot of the the questions in like Math Excel, um, a lot of them in like a, a general textbook are reverse engineered, meaning that they start with the, an answer that they want, and then they work backwards to generate the problem off that. Um, and they a lot of times they want these whole number answers. Uh, what about this next one? What is what is different about this last one? Okay, good. So, so when when we don't have y solved for, when y is not solved for, you can't determine the slope. This is in. Remember, this is standard. Uh, it's actually not even standard form because y and x are separated. This is just a. It's the equation of a line of two variables, uh, but it's a, a nasty format. Okay. Um, you can do one of two things. You can graph them the way we know how to graph them, or you can. Um, Rewrite this one so that you do have y solved for. Okay? So if I want to rewrite this one so that y is solved for, what am I going to do first here? If I want to isolate, I want to get y all by itself right here. So, okay, so if I subtract 3 from both sides, those are going to disappear. So it's going to give me like 3y equals 9x minus 3, right? Does that make sense? Now, how would I get this? Remember, we want to solve for y, which when I say solve for y, it means I'm solving for 1y like I did in that top one. So what do I need to do now to get this 3y to become a 1y? Divide by 3. And when you divide by 3 in an equation, when you divide by that coefficient, you're actually dividing everything by that. So 3 divided by 3 is 1. So it gives me my 1y that I was looking for. 9 divided by 3 gives me 3, and then 3 divided by 3 gives me 1, and it's negative 1. What's that tell us? Say it again. Careful. Negative 1 is where we cross the y-axis. 3 is the slope, so 3 over 1 is my slope. So, up three, one, two, three, over one. So, I get that, right? So, that would be it's a terrible line, but that would be that, maybe that top one, right? Now, would I go through the exact same procedure in graphing that one? Would I still go to the same y intercept, the negative one, and then up three over one? So, what's that telling me about those two lines? They are infinite solutions. They're the same line, right? They overlap. They, uh, the math word we use is that they coincide. Okay. Um, that kind of makes sense? All right, I, wanna I, wanna, I, I know I said we're going to go over those, but I want to show you one question. I want to do a question out of your homework with you real quick uh, because it was there was a handful of questions in the homework that gave you um, equations that were not in y equals mx plus b4, and they ask you to graph them. So I want to make sure that we, we talk about that. We've, we've done them before. Um, that, I think we should revisit it real quick. Uh, I'll look to see if I have any. I'm not sure if I do or not. If I don't, I could probably pick some off. 
Okay, so if we look at these, these first couple, you know, they're asking you to, to graph these just like we've been doing by hand, right? Okay, uh, they're y equals, y equals, that's good. Another one, y equals, y equals. These are different, okay? It says 3x plus 6y equals negative 24, um, and x plus y equals negative 5. What I would suggest doing is taking, remember that standard form. Now, you, you can rewrite like we did in that last example. If you want to rewrite both these in y equals mx plus b form, by all means, go ahead and do it. That's fine. It'll work. It's more time-consuming than the alternative I'm going to show you. Okay? But if I know that these are not solved for in terms of y, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about this first one, and I know I can graph this by finding a y-intercept and an x-intercept. So all I do is I write parentheses, I write an ordered pair, and I put zero in the x position or the y position. And then I write another ordered pair, and I put the zero in the position different than this one. Does that make sense? So here I put zero in the x, so this one I'm going to put zero in the y. And all I do then is I substitute. Okay, so my x value, my first x value here is 0. So if I put 0 in here, 3 times 0 goes away, right? And you're left with 6y equals negative 24. That's what you're left with. So what is, what is y then if I'm left with that equation? What's negative 24 divided by 6? Negative 4? Okay. So I know now 0, negative 4 is a point that it comes from that line or that is on that line, okay? Now over here, I'm telling you that my y value is 0. So that goes away when I substitute. And I'm left with 3x equals negative 24. If 3x equals negative 24, does that make x negative 8? Okay. So now when I graph that over here, and I believe... Correct me if I'm wrong. It allows you, when you click on this, when I click a point, I'm not, I don't use this very often. You guys use it more than I do. I thought there was an option that let you type in your order pairs. Is that not right? Okay, you're, you're right. So I think that's kind of a messy way of doing it. But um, so when I clicked on this, I put just a general line on there, hit save. Um, zoom out a little bit so you can see all of this. And then I double click on the line. You see where it says edit coordinates? If I click on edit coordinates, um, I'm able to type in 0, negative 4, which I, I don't know if that's any easier than, uh, because I took in, so in this situation, I let, because uh, I, I knew I was going to use x to be 0, so when I plug x in to be 0 right here, for 3x, three, 3 times 0 is 0, right? So I'm left with just 6y equals negative 24. And if I solve that for y, just divide by 6, it gives me negative 4. Can you try it? Maybe. You're fine. So when we, so we started with Started with the equation 3x plus 6y equals negative 24. We plugged the zero in, so that turned into 3 times 0 plus 6y equals negative 24. But 3 times 0 is just 0, right? So that 3 times 0 is just 0, so that 0 plus 6y is just 6y. 
And that's why we like to use the X and Y intercept technique here is because it just allows you, because that's always going to happen. That process of plugging in zero for X is always going to make that X term just disappear. So we can wipe it away, and we're just left with 6Y equals negative 24. Divide by 6 there, divide by 6 there, and now it gives me Y equals negative 4. So when I chose X to be 0, it then gave me my Y value to be that negative 4. So then obviously when you're graphing that, so we got 0, negative 4, and the other one was X be negative 8, 0. We move those, and now we've got that line. Okay, just real quick, let's let's run through what that next one will look like. Because the next one is still, I'll leave it zoomed out, but I'll write it down here so I can write it bigger. X plus Y, X plus Y equals negative 5. That's the second one I want to graph, right? So I'm going to let X be 0 and see what I get back for Y. Well, if X is zero, that thing right there turns into zero, and it goes away, right? So what's it leave me with Y? What's it tell me right, right away that Y is? I was going to say Y is negative five. So when X was zero, it went away, X went away, and I'm left with just Y equals negative five. So now, when I do the other one, now I'm going to let y equal 0. So if y is 0, so I plug in 0 right there, it vanishes. And now what are you left with? x equals negative 5, right? So now we should be able to plot those two. 0, negative 5, and negative 5, 0. Save that. And now, if I want to know where do these intersect, it looks like they're intersecting at negative 2, negative 2, right? I'm not sure if they, yeah, they don't ask for what the intersection is. They just want you to see if you got, okay, so once you graph it, hit save, and then it'll ask you for the solution. So then that's where you plug in negative 2, negative 2. Yes, Stella? All right, so it says find the linear models for each set of data. Uh, in what year will the two quantities be equal? Okay. Um, so it says let X be the number of years since 1970. Uh, what is the model for men? Okay, so if we look at this, basically what they're doing here is it says let X be the number of years since 1970. So when we see 1970 here, Actually, what I want to do, I'm going to cut that because I want to write quite a bit on here. So I'm going to just cut this out and move over to this. So what they're doing here... And, and, my ordered pairs that we're going to create here uh, are going to be x comma y's, obviously. And they're taking and saying that x is going to be your number of years. And y um, is going to be um, life expectancy, which is still a quantity of years. Uh, but the the x value is, you know, what was life expectancy in 1970? What was it in 1975? Uh, and then the life expectancy years is how long each, like, group of people is living, okay? Um, so what they do here, so instead of, so one, so if, if I'm talking about men right now, one ordered pair would be 1970, comma, 66.8. 
and another one would be maybe 1975, comma, uh, 68.8, and another one, 1980, 69.9, 1985, 71.1. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, so these two together are in order to pair, those two together in order to pair, those two, those two, those two, and so forth. Now, they phrase this a little bit differently here. Uh, it says, let X be the number of years since 1970. And the idea is we're going to have to find slope. And to find slope, we're going to take two points and subtract them, okay? Uh, subtract their X and subtract their Ys. Well, what happens is that they don't necessarily like us using these large numbers for your Xs. So what they say, and this, this is a personal preference if you even want to do this, uh, but say the numbers, number of years since 1970, so basically what they want to do, if it's 1970, how many years, if it's currently 1970, how many years is it since 1970? It'd be zero, right? So they're, they're basically saying instead of writing this number here, this ordered pair, rewrite it as 0, 066.8. Oh. Well, I'll, 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 it makes more sense when we, once, once we graph this stuff. So... Um, so 0, 066.8. So then 1975 would be how many years was 1975 since 1975? Um, so 5, 68.8. Um, and then the next one would be 10. Okay, so let me go through and do this. So the question is, why, why would they do that? Well, when we graph this, think about when I graph it. I need, I need to graph an X value and a Y value, right? I don't want to go out on my x-axis to 1970 to find that point. It's easier to, to just shift everything over and let that first year be zero, and then the x-coordinate of five actually represent 1975 and so forth. Um, I hate this thing. All right, so... I'm just going to write the, so I'll write 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30, okay? Um, so what we've got here is a series of ordered pairs. If we were to plot these points, let me uh, do this in GeoGebra real quick just to, to prove this point. You guys write that down, and I'll keep working over here. If we, if we graph those points, okay, do they all fall on the same line? No, okay, so um, like if I choose A and B as my ordered pairs, they don't maybe make the same line that's going to generate points D, E, and F. If I choose like B and C, they don't necessarily choose the other points, right? Okay, um, so... What we're going to do, and, and there's, I'm not going to get into it because it's, it's a very um, lengthy process in, in deciding uh, which points are the best ones to choose here. Uh, but basically, you guys ever talk about lines of best fit in science? Okay. That's really what we're doing here. We're trying to figure out what line here, which one of these lines could I put in here that really models my data the best. Okay, uh, and, and we have some, some rules that allow us to do that. Um, I'm going to 
just look at choosing um, let's say if I start at A and choose F is that a pretty good line of best fit Okay, and basically what happens when we choose a line of best fit in science, and like I said, there's, there's tools that, it's called linear regression, there's tools that allow us to do this uh, and get the best one. Um, but if you're just doing it without those tools, usually when you want to figure out your line of best fit, you're going about an equal amount of points above your line and an equal amount of points below your line, and obviously some points on your line. Okay, so I'm going to use A and F, and A and F for me uh, were... The, they would have been the ordered pair of 0, 66.8, and 30, 74.5. So 0, 66.8, and 30, which is 74.5. So what we need to do is we need to create an uh, equation for these. Well, if I need an equation, I need slope. So slope is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? So I'm going to go 74.5 minus 66.8 all over 30 minus 0. Okay, so it gets kind of messy here when we do that subtraction. Or not subtraction, but division. This is the part that makes it messy. So we go 74... 0.5 minus 66.8, and we'll divide that by 30, and that gives me a slope, and they went out to three decimal places, gives me a slope of 0.257, okay? Now, the nice thing about this is that that's a y-intercept, isn't it? Isn't it 0, 66.8, if we go back to our graph? Isn't that point right there a y-intercept? So then if I want to write my equation, y equals m, which was that number right there, so 0.257x, plus my y-intercept of 66.8. So that's the equation. That's the equation that models the men's life expectancy based off of the years from 1975. So if I asked it, Okay, how, how long should men be live, living in 2005? Okay, well, the X value that I would use would be 35, because that's how many years from 1970, right? So if I put 35 in right there, evaluate that, it will tell me how long life expectancy is for men in that year. It's a good prediction, okay? So now the next thing we would do is the same exact process, but for women. So for women, we'd have the year 1970, which is 76.2 years, and then the year 2000, which would have been an X value of 30 and 81.7. So there I would subtract the Ys again. And I would evaluate that. So I'll do that real quick. 81.7 minus 76.2 divided by 30 gives me 0.1833 repeating. So I'll just write 0.183. So that's my slope. That's my y-intercept again, right? So then for the women, my line would be 0.183x plus my y-intercept of 76.2. And those are my two equations that they'd be looking for, okay? Um, let's just kind of jump over to, I, I, I don't want, setting those equal each other algebraically and solving, that's kind of messy. So let's go ahead and we'll graph these. And I'm, you're not, you know, that would be kind of messy to graph that slope by hand, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, so we're going to jump into a, uh, Desmos and let that, find the answer for us. Well, hold on. Hold on. 
So we've got, so I'll type this, so 0 0.257, so y equals 0.257x plus 66.8, and then y equals 0.183x, plus then 76.2, okay? So now, obviously, because my y-intercepts are up in the 60s and 70s, I'm gonna zoom out to get my two lines, but they're gonna intersect, right? They intersect over here, and it tells me 127. So remember, the x value was the years it was from 1970, right? So if I take 1970, 127. So 1970 plus 127 years says in 2097, based off this model, in the year 2097, we should see that men and women's life expectancies are the same. Okay? They both have risen to 99.5 free round. Um, and that's still a bad job of rounding, but about 99 and a half years. Uh, will be the life expectancy if that data is accurate, okay? And so you ask, you know, where am I ever going to use this? Well, outside of school, I'm not sure, okay? It depends on what you do, okay? I use this stuff uh, all the time when I'm trying to figure out bills, uh, when I'm trying to figure out uh, budgeting uh, in, in my, my finances instead of just winging it and saying, man, I hope at the end of the, the year I have money to pay my taxes or my house insurance or something like that. I use this type of stuff to, to help out with that. Um, in a science class, you guys might do a, um, a, an experiment where you're measuring like temperatures of something over a, a, a sustained period of time, and you collect that data, and then you make an equation of that line to make further predictions of observed times that, or times that you have not observed. So if I'm in class, so let's say, for example, in, in a science class, we might take uh, – uh, let's just say boiling water, okay? And we take boiling water, we take it off the Bunsen burner, we lay it on the, uh, the pot on the counter, and we start taking temperatures at like five-minute intervals. And I take maybe 10 temperatures. So I, I've, I've taken temperatures for 50 minutes, okay? I could collect the data like this, okay, and organize it in a chart like this. And once I take that data and organize it, then I can write an equation like we did here, Okay, and then once I've got that equation, I can then predict, okay, what if I leave that, that boiling water sit beyond 50 minutes? I go, go to another class, 